Good afternoon from an overcast Washington, and good evening from virtual Davos. I'm Ishan Tharoor, foreign affairs columnist at the Washington Post, and anchor of today's worldview, the Post's daily column on global politics. I'm really delighted to be moderating what is an essential discussion on tackling inequality in the decade of action as part of the forum's Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Uh, today, you heard President Biden speaking at the UN General Assembly warning that we now live in a decisive decade. And for his part, he and other wealthy and he and other leaders from wealthy governments are pressing ahead on action around climate change, as well as action on, on, on the pandemic and the spread of vaccines. But, but what we've seen over the past uh, year and a half in the middle of the pandemic is that even when uh, the international community, governments, the public sector, private sector come together to rally around global crises, uh, many of the solutions don't yield fully sustainable or inclusive solutions. So I'm here today joined by a terrific panel of, of public and private pr practitioners to talk through how we can uh, tackle, as the title says of the panel, uh, the in inequities that we're seeing exposed by, not just to say the spread of the pandemic or the spread of climate change, but our responses to it. Uh, so I'm joined by, uh, first but not least, uh, Gabriel Rucher, uh, Executive Director of Oxfam, Aaron Kramer, President and Chief Executive Officer of Business for Social Responsibility, or BSR, Peter Lacey, Chief Responsibility Officer and Global Sustainability Services Lead for Accenture, and Aditi Mohapatra, Vice President for Global Social Impact and Sustainability at the Expedia Group. Gabriela, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you and I spoke uh, at the forum uh, almost, in, in, I guess, in this year, but in January, at a slightly different stage of the pandemic. And we looked rather gloomily ahead uh, at at some of the challenges facing the world and the inequities that the pandemic exposed in societies across the world's continents. Uh, where are we now <laughs> since that moment in January? What have you seen in terms of uh, the, the course of the recovery and how the recovery has played out? And what are the other kind of fissures and social inequities that are widening that you are worried about? Thanks, Ishan. So it's great to be here and to connect again, as you say, after I think it's been seven, eight months since we last had this opportunity. And, and yes, before all, I want to say that what we've gone through now a year and a half of this pandemic and, and this common experience in humanity is, is a real chance, a chance for change that we really haven't seen in, in a very long time, in a generation. So it's the wake up call, not just in poor countries, but now everywhere that the climate crisis is really here. And we heard it uh, from the people on the video in the introductory video, but also increasingly a recognition that the market on its own will not save your livelihood or your life in the middle of a pandemic, but government can. So these are paradigm shifts and, and they really offer us hope. And I, I still have that hope because I think we need to translate that, that thinking and that realization into real policy change, not just go back to the ideas that made us so insecure in the first place. So, and that was the kind of spirit that was seen at the end of World War II that took on solidarity and in, in really brought the, the richest and met, we met people's rights and they really shared prosperity at the time, transforming how things had been um, dealt with before. So that means three things at the common at this moment in time. First, it has to mean that we take on extreme wealth in our economy. So billionaire wealth has shot up more over the past 17 months than it has in the past 15 years. While at the same time, hundreds of millions have fallen into poverty. So this is really alarming and such extreme inequality is of course not good for poverty reduction, for social cohesion and for anybody and it's definitely not good for democracy. So we need to really think of a range of tools to, to begin to radically shift course and fund a recovery that starts with taxing capital and wealth. 
um, and to really reduce this extreme inequality. Every large corporation needs to be paying their fair share of tax in every country. After World War II, uh, Roosevelt ensured corporations paid between 40 and 50% tax rates. And that stayed on for decades because there was public support for that policy. And I think that should be our ambition now. This year, we could see a historic tax deal, but it will only really be historic if we get the global minimum tax rate, not in line with tax havens where it is at the moment, but really at least 25%. And second, it's very important that we don't treat the inequality and climate crisis as separate, but really it's, it's one crisis that is intertwined. Our economy is one where the richest 1% of humanity use double the carbon of the poorest 50%, who in turn are hit hardest by climate change. So we have to bring down the emissions of the riches to stand a chance of defeating climate change. And we need not just vague net zero promises from governments and corporations that can pass on the buck for reducing emissions to others, but real zero targets that drastically cut emissions and phase out fossil fuels and then invest in clean energy and supply chains. And the third is, yes, we're all beginning to talk about recovery. But the reality is that we have rich governments whose decisions are prolonging the pandemic. So the current model of defending the big pharmaceutical monopolies is keeping billions excluding, excluded from, from vaccine supply. So the result is thousands of people each day are dying whose lives could have been saved by a vaccine, but it is also sustaining the virus and all the consequences that it has had on people's lives. So if we want to talk recovery, we need to waive the patents and make a people's vaccine available for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. That is a, a rather uh, ambitious and significant set of proposals from you know, new stringent uh, corporate tax rates to uh, recognizing the need for uh, certain private intellectual property protections to be waived so that we can help poor, poorer countries develop their own vaccine and, and boost the spread of the vaccines. These are huge political uh, questions. Aaron, I'd like to turn to you uh, to talk a bit more here in Washington, of course, uh, some of this, uh, some of what Gabriella laid out in terms of uh, raising taxes and figuring out how to, to uh, you know, spread vaccines and so forth are you know, very much on, uh, on the docket here in Washington, the Democrats, the Biden administration are, are trying to push through some pretty significant tax reforms. We'll see whether they're actually able to. But could you talk a bit about how you've seen this past year um, with this administration uh, and its approach to some of these uh, uh, major issues around reckoning with climate change, uh, around building a more sustainable recovery in the pandemic, as well as, of course, in your field, how it intersects with uh, your reading of the corporate sector and the kind of public-private partnerships that can emerge. Thanks, Ishan. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, you know, the, the interesting and maybe troubling thing is, even if we weren't dealing with the global pandemic, we would we were already dealing with some very profound changes and and challenges. So certainly, the climate crisis structural inequality in, in, in really every country uh, around the world and technological change that is coming so fast that even as it enables us to do lots of exciting things, it also presents some pretty big challenges. And that's all against the landscape of significant uh, generational change, um, decline in, in democratic institutions and processes and business model disruption that is happening very, very rapidly. So the agenda is a, a, a very significant one. A lot of these things also are interlocking challenges. And I think that is both the, the, the problem, but also may lead the way to the solution. So 230 editors in chief of major medical journals just a couple of weeks ago um, issued a joint call saying that the climate crisis was the number one public health problem facing humanity. When that comes out, an unprecedented collaboration in the middle of a global pandemic, I think that speaks very loudly about the fact that climate change is a human issue, it is an economic issue, and it's one that affects our well-being in very, very substantial ways. 
So that does seem like it is a big set of so-called wicked problems, but in fact, I think that is partly also the pathway to the answer. So Gabriella spoke of some of the innovations that took place after World War II, and I think we're at a similar moment. We are present at the creation, if you will, of a new set of solutions. And in our view, something that is relevant both for policymakers and also for the private sector is the urgent need to create a modernized social contract that will enable people to thrive, communities to thrive and be represented in policy processes and economic activity, and for national economies and the global economy uh, to create, enable prosperity, enable innovation, while also reducing the inequity, the inequality that is plaguing us on both a human level uh, and, an, and an economic level. And so I think some of the policy steps being debated in Washington are, they are, they represent generational change. They, they really cannot be overstated. It's a very profound set of changes. The European Union's undertaking similar steps. I think the time is right to do that. And business often dislikes that kind of activity. I actually think that it is far and away in the interest of business uh, to call for action on some of these questions. And we've seen a number of businesses advocate for greater racial equity, for decisive climate action, and, and even for tax fairness. And uh, that is, uh, I think the North Star is a new social contract that maybe borrows from the spirit of the post-war world, but creates a model that is the one we need for the 21st century. If I can press you just a little bit further on that, I mean, this idea of a modernized social contract, incredibly important, incredibly compelling. Uh, can it emerge without structural political reforms and significant structural political reforms? Well, um, we could talk at great length about the dysfunction of our democratic uh, processes, which I think both are about structural challenges. Um, you know, we see in the United States, uh, a minority of voters has selected a president more than once in the last uh, five elections, six elections. So there's clearly an issue there. Um, and I think obviously the interference with democratic processes born of some of the, the technologies that we otherwise rely upon and, and like quite a lot, these are profound challenges. So yes, political reform is absolutely essential. There's no doubt about it. In the United States, campaign finance leads to all sorts of distortions and inequity. So absolutely, yes. But I also think that even with the structures we have, if the political will is there amongst elected officials, if the business community speaks out about the need to create the kinds of policies that will enable uh, innovation, uh, will enable transparency, will enable market uh, rules and incentives to point towards long-term value creation, I think we would make a, a, an immense amount of progress. So let's, let's shift then to the business community. Uh, Aditi, you are at Expedia, a, a company that, of course, uh, must have had an incredibly interesting and probably difficult experience of the pandemic. Uh, what lessons has, have you learned in terms of the work you are doing both within the company and without uh, in terms of, of you know, what a major player uh, like Expedia uh, can, can do uh, on the world stage. And of course, there is a parallel and probably a second question about climate change, because of course, uh, global travel is a part of the climate problem and perhaps it can be part of the climate solution. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here and very happy to speak a little bit about the work that Expedia has been doing and realizing um, at this moment. I think Gabrielle called it a wake up call and both of these confounding crises are absolutely wake up calls for the travel industry. They are impacting the travel industry in real deep and profound ways. Um, first and foremost with the COVID crisis, it is something that we are of course, um, you know, very much impacted by all aspects of our business has been. Um, and it's one where we see a, a near term solution, vaccines, right? And we want to make sure that all the world has the access to the vaccines that we have um, in our communities here. We've kicked off a campaign over the last month, which is called Give the World a Shot, where we are really working on getting more vaccines to 
and countries in need in partnership with UNICEF. We've raised about $10.6 million to give to UNICEF to help with vaccine uh, distribution in, in countries that are in need. Beyond that, we've issued a call to action to our corporate sector peers to get involved in this. It seems to be an issue that not enough companies are paying attention to, and we know we all can't come back until the world is vaccinated, right? This is an issue that really does require all of us to be paying attention and all of us to be activated around it. So um, we've issued a call to action. Of course, the travel industry can't address this alone. It is very much material to us, but it is one that we want the rest of um, our corporate partners to also be paying close attention to. Beyond that, on climate change, of course, this is something that's also very much present for us on a daily basis. The destinations that we serve, where we send our travelers to, are every day impacted by the climate crisis. Of course, beach towns are eroding. We have ski resorts that don't have any snow. We have fires overtaking lots of different communities. So in every which way, especially the physical impacts of climate change are having a tremendous a disruption to the destinations that we serve. And underneath those destinations and that physical kind of manifestation is really the communities who are really reliant on tourism and travel for their livelihoods. Um, travel and tourism represents one in 10 jobs globally. In many nations, it represents 30% of GDP. In the Caribbean, it's 30% of, of employment. And so we're looking really hard at how we can partner with um, some of the small and medium-sized businesses that exist in these communities using a lens of equity, first and foremost, really trying to get in there and to understand who is really underserved in these communities, how can we partner, what are their needs, and really centering the solutions um, that they identify in the kinds of uh, tools that we can bring to really partner with them over the long term and help them build more resilient businesses to withstand what we know is coming ahead. Peter, if I could quickly turn to you, uh, you are Chief Responsibility Officer at Accenture. And as we talk about finding uh, equitable and inclusive solutions to a range of social crises, whether it's the pandemic or the climate change, so forth, what responsibilities do businesses and major companies like yours have for modeling that kind of inclusion and sustainability in their own right and in their own internal functionings? Well, I think, um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I can't think of a more important topic to be discussing right now, um, at the convergence of a number of the different forces that uh, I think that others in the panel have already laid out. Um, I think the direct answer to your question is that there is an enormous obligation on business to ensure that the, the way that they think about their core purpose, the way that they think about their vision, their strategy, their operations, their value chains, um, are positively contributing to tackling um, inequalities, to tackling inequalities of different types, but also to tackle directly the sustainable development goals, which are, I think, um, while of course always imperfect, are the best roadmap that we have to tackling sustainable development in its true integrated sense, including um, poverty alleviation, uh, including eradicating hunger, including good jobs, uh, including tackling that in the context of, of climate change uh, and broader environmental sets of issues. So I think that is my starting point, our starting point. And the twist I would give it, um, Ishan, would be on the one hand, you can see it as a moral obligation. And I think many of us would see it as a moral obligation as part of what it means to be uh, a successful business in successful societies. On the other hand, and, and you can sort of see, I keep it behind me, the SDGs as, as the picture behind me. Uh, I keep it there for a very specific reason. I think it is the world's first ever um, and most extensively codified innovation roadmap for markets and business over the next decade. Arguably, it takes place or it has been created in parallel to the uh, first time that we have ever been as conscious, and Aaron mentioned this, um, in terms of technology and the incredible pace of technology, it takes, it takes place against the backdrop 
of a world that is very conscious of going through a fourth industrial revolution. Breakthroughs in science, in engineering, uh, that have been creating possibilities in new business models that were simply unthinkable even five, 10 years ago, and changing the cost base of everything from digital technologies to bank the unbanked, uh, to opening up new forms of entrepreneurship, uh, new shifts from products to services. And so you take those two things together, we have this incredible codified innovation roadmap, the Paris goals and the SDGs. We have this incredible you know, once a century, once every 50 years, industrial revolution taking place. And the job of businesses should be to incorporate that into their strategies to drive their own competitiveness while being able to measure the impact that they have on things like inequality. Now, what I will say, um, is that, you know, just a couple of thoughts just to stimulate debate. Every three years for the last uh, 14 years, 15 years, um, I've led the world's largest study of CEOs on sustainability for the UN Secretary General, for three of the Secretary Generals now in a row. And in this particular study, which will be released in, a, in well, the next week, I think, at the UNGA week, um, you know, we were, made a very specific effort under the new Executive Director, Sandro Jambo, to look at what CEOs in the Global South were saying around some of the themes like inequality and business tackling inequality. Um, and, and I think it's not all good news. Um, twice as many CEOs from the Global South as the Global North have told us that over the, and this is 1,000 CEOs, 426 from the Global South, have told us that the pandemic has had a significant negative impact on their ability to address sustainable development in their core businesses. 39% of CEOs from the Global South have said that uh, their company's budget for tackling sustainability initiatives, quite understandably, uh, has been reduced as a, and comparatively only 24% in the Global North said the same. And so I think it's incredibly important to realize that not only is it important for us to all to see the SDGs as an innovation roadmap, to see Paris as an innovation roadmap, to incorporate that, into our businesses, but to be very clear that the pandemic has not had an even impact around the world. It has massively disadvantaged and potentially slowed the potential for investment, which is why I come back to the um, intersection that a number of different speakers have made with climate change and with tackling carbon emissions and with the upcoming Glasgow summit uh, in just a few weeks now, I mean, hardly even months, and why it is so important that if we want to tackle inequality structurally and we want to tackle the incredible challenge of adaptation or to mitigate where we have the greatest impact and create new jobs, new markets, new growth, we are going to have to make absolutely sure that the delivery of the $100 billion climate finance commitment um, mobilized through public and private interventions takes place. That is an absolute necessity that must come out of COP. And I'll make many businesses that we've spoken to have said the same thing. And we must look at how the next nine years combines the public and private sector investment in things like the digital revolution and the fourth industrial revolution and arcs that curve towards tackling sustainability in the form of climate change, which will exacerbate many of those inequalities and directly inequality, because there simply isn't the capital. I mean, the UN and Bank of America estimate more than six trillion a year needed every year to deliver the sustainable development goals. And we are missing it every year at the moment. And so I think all these issues come together and become incredibly important that business has a very loud and clear voice about what it expects at COP, uh, as well as other forces and other actors. Peter, thanks for that. You really put, put a lot of things together for us uh, and we're really very close to running out of time. But I'd like to just pick up from there and then quickly turn to the rest of the panel, Gabriella, Aaron, 
and Aditi, um, if you can offer a couple of 30 second closing thoughts, um, based on sitting on your sitting you know, based on where you are sitting in your perch, um, what has the experience of the how has it informed your view on how the how we tackle the much broader issue of the climate? Uh, let's start with you, Gabriella, since you raised it in your opening remark. Yeah, so very quickly, I would say we have seen what is possible as we come together and the role of the state. So I think for business, it means paying taxes, paying workers a living wage, and really committing to cutting emissions and, and not focusing on net zero in terms of, of um, passing the buck. And in terms of the pandemic at the moment, it's really to think how we make the vaccine a global good by waiving intellectual property rights. So that is something that needs to be uh, in, in place for a moment such as a pandemic. And I think, um, again, we can have exceptional measures that address the climate crisis because we already know we can do it collectively. So I, I, I have hope. It's a great note. Uh, Aaron, uh, how about, what do you think? Well, I won't recite all of the difficult things we've experienced. Let me point to three positives. The first is the rise of ESG investing is flowing a lot of very serious money into a different kind of economy. That's been arguably the brightest spot over the last 18 months. Number two, boards of directors are paying significantly more attention to climate, to structural racism, another range of, and, 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 and other issues. And the third flowing from that is businesses are finally starting to understand that it's essential that they create resilient business strategies that embrace all of the social and environmental change that we're experiencing and designing businesses that make a positive impact outward for society and help them withstand the kinds of shocks that we may well experience again. And Aditi, I think you should close us out now uh, since we're, we're now over time, but it's been a really, we could go on for so much longer. Sure. So I think, you know, the, the most optimistic parts are definitely the cooperation and the partnership. We know it's necessary for the, for the global pandemic, particularly around vaccinations. Now we know we all have to work together. Similarly, on climate change, it will take the same kind of spirit and unity. Um, and we need to just make sure that we continue to put people at the center. Um, climate change is obviously an incredibly challenging and complex problem. And the people um, and solutions that really address the impacts on people really need to be at the center of it. Well, great. Thank you to uh, Gabriela, Aaron, Aditi, and Peter. Uh, this has been a you know, tremendous start to a conversation. We could take it, like so many other conversations hosted by the mm -hmm. forum, uh, we could, it could be an extended one that we'll hopefully keep having offline, on top link, on social media. Uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, hope to speak to you soon. Take care.